if you think about that, Lingat people, um, they wrote on, on everything. Um, the written language is on the spoons, it's on the clothes, it's on, there's very little if you would look it into, was on everything. it was on everything. If you looked at all the things that the Athlingat people made and used and, you know, functional art, yeah, that's a, that's a good term, but I, I would like to call it written history because everything had decorations, everything had some piece of information on it. And so, like, like the written word that is all collected within the libraries, we have a lot of written history for the Tlingit people that has been collected and is preserved in museums. Um, now we just have to be there, like the time we've spent in places like the Smithsonian and places. I do harvest my own spruce root. I go out in the spring um, and get the spruce roots. This is some really fine stuff. It's about 40 to the inch. The size of the root dictates the size of your weaving. Um, I go out every spring, usually take a group of people, and it's like a runner root. It's not like um, the root that feeds the tree, so it's like a strawberry runner. And I pull those out, they're long and straight. They can be up to 30 to 40 feet. Usually adverse soil conditions are best. Um, and they kind of are a, a lateral root that help the tree with stability for wind. They're pretty unique to kind of the coastal Alaska and down to Northern California. Do you yeah. split the root? And yeah. yes, I do split the root. I, I, within two hours of digging it out of the ground, I burn it in a hot fire. I pull it through an ina, which is a stick with a split in it. And then I start splitting it and I don't use a tool. I use my hands and my mouth because I need to follow the grain of the wood. So usually a, a slingat basket has the three bands. Many times these two are the same um, and then the one in the middle is different. Yeah. And when this was new the grass would have been very brilliant light colored and the spruce roots would have also. So this red line that you see on the inside would have been very much the part that set the grass design off from the uh, spruce root field. They have designs that when the weaver did them, she couldn't even see them. Go ahead. But then when they get a little bit older, you can see the light colors, and the spruce root is darkened, but the grasses stayed real light, so as they got older, the patterns became more clear. Um, and a lot of the ones that you see in the, in the display cases, you can see the patterns really nicely. The red would have been alder bark originally, and the bark would have been hemlock bark. But this, I would guess, is maybe an aniline dye. In fact, you see this one in uh, this war club pattern in the central design field, in particular, uh, Chief Catlian's robe out of Sitka had that pattern. This is a style of weaving, it's, they call it Chilkat style of weaving. Um, I'm Tlingat, Dr. Dan, and I do um, Tlingat weaving. So the materials, um, traditionally it was mountain goat, but it's kind of hard to come by mountain goat, been working on it, you know, we've got more of it, but not enough to, to really weave with yet. Um, so the warps, which is the hanging down parts, are leg spun, and this is a combination of wool and cedar bark. And so you spin them on your leg, and it comes out with a really dense material, um, which is really good for weaving patterns on like this, especially since you're, you're weaving it, there's no, um, no shuttle and no tension on the warps, like a tradition, like other types of weaving. So when you're weaving, it's just two strand twining, so your fingers are in, and you have two strands of your weavers, and you just put them around the warps. So having good solid warps helps you not to be pulling in and, and you know, being able to make consistent patterns. Patterns that are recognizable. That was when they started putting the, the totemic or the clan crests or story patterns or something. Form line? Like, form line. Form line, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so this one is, is a very, um, it's not a pattern that I did, um, but it's a diving wheel pattern and there are, it's been done many times. A lot of times the pattern boards were done over and over. They'd paint a pattern board and then the weaver would look at the pattern board and weave it. So on this one, if you were to identify it, 
usually people first look at that face in the middle and say, oh, it's a human. Well, most of the form line or the chill cat pieces have this human looking face in it. And it's representational of the spirit of whatever the creature is. So in a lot of the native stories, um, like the story about the bear or something where, where the bear takes their skin off and there's a person inside, the spirit person inside, um, this represents that spirit where they take their skin off and it's the person inside. So usually it's in the center of the, of the animal or whatever creature it is they have on there and it's just a human face. The nice thing about Chilcat, which is different in process than basket weaving or raven's tail weaving, you can go back and forth. It's kind of like painting with wool. So it gives you more freedom to do multicolored pieces. So like I would take this blue and I could go back and forth and back and forth, or the yellow back and forth. And so you can fill in kind of like tapestry, but it gives you the opportunity to do something that no other weaving, weaving technique does, which is weave circles and circles are very fun to weave. You know, when I look at the, I look at the chill cats that are in the museums and try, try to regain some of that technique, and I keep spinning finer and finer and finer, and, and man, I'm, I've gotten it pretty fine, because <laughs> um, I do all my own spinning, but doggone, it just doesn't look the same, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll weave it, and it still doesn't look as good as the stuff in the museums, and I, I finally have come to realize that it's, it's the material. It's the material, because they used Mountain goat. How much does it take for a robe? For uh, did she ask that before? Yeah, about five goats worth. So, just for the warps, for the warps on a raven's tail, because I've, I've spun it, it's about five pounds of wool. Um, once it's leg spun into the warps, and then you're probably going to have, I don't know, another two or three pounds in in weavers. How long does it take to complete a robe? Um, we both have different answers to that. Um, I have done a, a robe in as fast as 800 hours, um, but I have also taken over 2,000 hours to do a raven's tail style robe. Now this is the open sort of style weaving with the tassels. Um, these ones uh, don't have the density of weaving, although the 2,000 hour one was dense like a chill cat robe. Um, and that did not include the spinning. That 2,000 hours did not include the spinning. And the spinning is a lot.